Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and we are one kilometre out from module 82 BD, and we're going to make our terminal course corrections here. Now, on the nav ball, you can see the green retrograde marker showing my velocity, and you can see the pink marker showing the location of the target, or the location of the target behind me. Now, I want to try to make those things as close together as possible. Now, when I'm firing my engines in reverse and I'm not firing them through the retrograde marker, then what will happen is I will tend to push the retrograde marker away from it. So if I offset in the opposite direction, and this is only going in reverse, right? When you're going towards something in reverse, I offset and fire and see how it pushed the velocity vector away from the position where my, my pointing vector it's complicated, but you imagine that when you the retrograde vector always gets pushed away from where you're pointing when you fire your engines forward. When you have the prograde vector, that gets pulled towards that. It's it's just a kind of standard trick here. So I'm just trying to get it to sit just on top of the target. Now, they're about 600 meters out. That means there were a couple of minutes out. And... Although I've lined these things up right now, as we get in, first of all, just the, the error in my original pointing is going to get exaggerated. But on top of that, the fact that we are getting pulled around the planet and space is curved, essentially, right? The orbits that we are on are curved means that we, while I was going towards it, I'm getting pulled off of that very slowly by the, the rotation, by the fact that we're following orbits around the planet. So... I'm just having to make continual corrections. Obviously, if you are doing this in a real spacecraft, if you're trying to dock the Soyuz to the ISS, somebody has pre-calculated all these offset burns and they've compressed it into a single burn so that you end up just naturally floating right outside the, the docking port that you're looking for. I, on the other hand, don't have all that and so therefore I'm making these corrections mostly by hand. There we go, just under 3 meters per second. The good news is if we collide with it at this speed, then it's unlikely to destroy us. Okay, yeah, I think I can see what this is now. At least, I'm guessing I know what this is. If only I had a flashlight, I could actually see what I was looking at here. But I didn't fit anything to this, and, and also it's obviously very complicated since my light switch is what controls my main rocket motors. Okay, so looks... I think we might actually pass over the top of it now. Oh, you know, I think we might actually have some uh, lights on this. Hold on. Yeah, there we go. Right over the top. Now, look, here's an idea. Oh, oh, look at how close that is. Right, let's turn it on here. Uh, lights on. So the landing gear actually has lights built it. Look at me, it's scraping along the bottom here. Oh, dear. Uh, yeah, I think I've probably lost a whole bunch of heat insulating tiles. Okay, it's now going the wrong way. Shall rotate my spacecraft so I can actually illuminate this. There you see, it's the crew pod. This is the four-man crew pod. It's very efficient. Two and a half ton get two and a half tons for four crew members. It's the most efficient way to put crew into space. Well, short of strapping them to seats on the outside of your spacecraft. Which is entirely possible, but since you can't put people in them, and since you can't put Kerbals in them in the uh, vehicle assembly building, that is not the most, it's not the easiest thing to do. Okay, so I think we want to wait until it's daytime before we perform this actual, before we perform the, the actual, uh, like, securing of the package. Sun will rise soon. Uh, you see, we're picking up speed relative to the target once again because space is curved. There we go. I'm going to rotate the thing upside down so at least it's roughly in the right direction for us. Now, I should probably put away that landing gear because it's it's really not the done thing to go flying around in space with your gear hanging out right like that. Let's decouple this and now enable... Yeah, there we go. Enable RCS and nope, it's it's I. Yes, it's push. No, it's K. Take K. That's us moving outwards. 
control from here. Arm the claw. Point towards the target. And now, look at this. I'm just I'm just using lateral thrust here. You know, I H I J K N L. And I'm just floating onto this. Oh. <laughs> I, I have practically used no fuel at all there. That was so much for the vast amount of fuel reserves I brought with me on this. Okay, so now that fuel is actually useful because we're going to perform the deorbit burn with it. And we want to do the deorbit, you know, relatively... We, we want to make sure that we, we do it as close to the, the landing site as possible. So that we maximize our return from all this. Now let's see... Bingo... So I, oh look, we're actually flying out over the the desert. So this is actually probably going to bring us pretty close to the the space center. Yeah. Although actually, I think I'm going to go in very very carefully with this. The reason is that I don't have any heat shields, and if the parachutes go, I will lose the module and I will lose the spacecraft and everything else. So what we're going to do is just I'm just firing it backwards, holding the H key while uh, in RCS mode will accelerate me forwards and will bring the periaps down to about 30 to 40 kilometers. Okay, well we had a quick tea break and now we're falling towards Kerbin. Gravity will hopefully do as much of this as possible, but uh, now I think about it, I want to make sure that I lighten this spacecraft as much as possible. That That's about one ton of fuel I still have have there, so I want to try and do stuff during descent to make sure that I burn up the fuel. So what am I going to do here? I guess I can, I'm going to fire this downwards so, and then I'm going to bring the thing upwards. So I'm pushing myself towards the planet. This is largely a bunch of pointless stuff to, to use up fuel while I'm performing the descent. The more fuel we have, the heavier we are the faster we hit the water, the more likely that we lose our very valuable piece of hardware. This is a recovery mission, and you're supposed to recover the part intact rather than in pieces. So yeah, I'm just pushing myself downwards, right? And the idea is that once we get below about 40 kilometers, I'm going to reverse these, and we're going to start flattening out the trajectory. The idea simply is that I want to get deeper into the atmosphere so that I can slow down faster and then I'm going to start uh, arresting my vertical speed. That's the idea. We'll try and keep it at a reasonable altitude where the drag is sufficient to slow us down faster. There's the space center. Wouldn't it be nice to land there? Sorry, I'm going to pass you by. There, now we're pulling ourselves up. Oh, okay, now, now apparently... The aerodynamics has kicked in. We're slowing down in this direction. Well, I guess I'm going to help the aerodynamics. I was hoping that I would be able to flatten out my trajectory, but I failed. Instead, I'm going to use the, the thrusters to help me decelerate, and hopefully, 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 nothing explodes. Yay, nothing exploded. That's all good. Continuing to perform fuel burns to slow the spacecraft down. I'm, I'm actually surprised at how well I got that through the center of mass. That was very lucky there. Because if you didn't have it quite through the center of mass, you might have to adjust your spacecraft or you might be wasting fuel the whole time. Okay, down to about 100 meters per second and still burning fuel. I'm going to land in the water. Uh, water is... Far more dangerous than land for landing. I think I've explained this before, but uh, the problem with landing in water is when you land on land, the first thing that hits if it's going too fast, it will explode, but it will also transmit physics back. Whereas if it hits the water, then the physics doesn't get transmitted back and therefore subsequent parts don't slow down as much. So crumple zones work when you're landing on land. They don't work when you're landing on water in Kerbal Space Program. Okay, I am concerned. It says 7 meters per second. I'm firing these engines. It brings my speed down to about 6.6. .6. I'm pretty sure the maximum impact velocity of this uh, crew can is about 6 meters per second. So I think I may have actually failed this mission and I should have brought extra parachutes. But we're going to try anyway. 
throttle, full power, full power. I'm pressing a uh, pressing N there to give me maximum reverse thrust. 6.4. Oh, I survived. Good lord, I did not expect that. But I'll take that. That is a mission successful. We have recovered. We have recovered the debris, and we will, of course, uh, you know, pass it on to the relevant individuals and charge them lots of money for it. So, part recovery contracts aren't particularly profitable, I would guess. Uh, in fact, the spacecraft that I sent up probably cost way more than the amount of money I'm making from this. There, sixty-five or sixty-four thousand, plus we uh, an extra. Okay, so it's about seventy thousand. And so to make a profit on this, we actually need to recover our space plane, which is of course why you use space planes. Now, to aid with recovery, there is a trick which has often been mentioned to me, but I've never put in any of my videos. I'm going to take the science rover, mostly because it's here and it works as a rover. So what we're going to do is add some landing aids to the Kerbal Space Center. Right, landing aids are essentially flags which you can target and it'll provide you some localization, or provide you some, you know, navigation tools or whatever to help you target things more precisely. The runway doesn't have ILS or any beacons or anything. So I'm just turning this backwards and then we're going to head out along the 270 vector just until we're on grassland. The reason you want to go onto grassland is because it's not part of the runway. Anything left on the runway will get obliterated whenever you put a new rocket or a new plane or something on the runway. So you want to make sure you're not on it. And then once you're not on it, or once you're far enough off of it, you can uh, put on your brakes and then you will be able to... Well, I'm going to stop the engines, obviously. And this takes a very, very long time to slow down. The brakes in these little uh, landing gear is terrible. Okay, Valentina, you are going to play Flag Girl, but uh, actually, now I think about it, I bet you we haven't got a surface sample from here. And I, I think it's great that you can take a surface sample while standing on, like, a pod. So we're going to take a sample of the pod. Okay, climb down the side. Oh, God, get yourself up here. And then move out this way and plant a flag. So this is going to be one of the navigation aids which we can target to make sure we're lined up with the runway. It'll help us, like, figure out whether we're on a good glide slope and things like that. And now I realise that I sh probably should have put a ladder on this thing, shouldn't I? I wonder if I can climb up this this wheel here, or if I'm just going to have to recover these and, you know, save them. Come on, climb! Where's that fabled Kerbal climbing ability? There we go, climb! Yes! Okay, now, let's see if I can negotiate my way up this. Look, look, look! Yes! Ha! I cannot believe that is working! Holy... <laughs> Valentina, you are parkour extraordinaire. Okay. Um, so now, yeah, we got to get to the other end of the runway. Since we're out, we might as well do both ends of the runway. You never know which way you'll be approaching from. I have successfully... I've done space plane missions and approached from both directions. It just sometimes you overshoot, sometimes you don't overshoot. Anyway, we're going to do this all at four times regular speed because this is a very long and tedious run down the runway. Actually, I do it at 40 meters per second. This thing is a lot faster than a regular rover. As you would expect, after all, it is pretty aerodynamic and has a big jet engine on the back. So uh, 40 meters per second is nothing. The regular rover wheels, incidentally, have speed limits, uh, typically about 10 or 20 meters per second if you exceed those you can find your rover wheels getting damaged. There is a legit reason to use plain wheels on a rover. Unfortunately, they don't have any power. Okay, EVA and place your flag, Val. Place your flag. Uh, not going to bother with the, the climbing back on this time. Now, uh, I'm going to call these, by the way, you might have noticed that I called the other one Runway East. This one is Runway West, but the smart people will point out, but you're standing at the east end of the runway. Yes, I am. But if I'm approaching heading west, this is the one that I want to target because that is closest to where I want my wheels to touch down. That's why I've kind of got them backwards. And it's not just because I got confused. No, there's, there is a legitimate reason for this. And we will we'll test them out 
in the next episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.